Welcome to the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Meet em, greet em, treat em, and street em. Today's date is February 11th, 2024, and I'm your skeptical host, Ken Milne. The title of today's podcast is Do 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 Da Dash Dash Dashed Diagnosing Acute Aortic Syndrome in the Emergency Department. And our guest skeptic is Dr. Nirdosh Kumar, and he is an emergency medicine specialist at the Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi, Pakistan. Welcome to the SGEM, Nir Dosh. Thank you so much, Dr. Ken, for having me in your podcast today. I'm really excited to be part of this fantastic podcast on one of the nightmare diagnoses of emergency physicians around the globe. Well, you are the first and therefore the best person we've ever had on the SGEM as a guest skeptic from Pakistan. I think this is really exciting for me. Yeah, uh, equally exciting for me as well. Well, perhaps you could tell the SGMers a little bit about yourself and your interest in FOMED and how we actually met. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Dr. Ken, so my interest in FOMED uh, evolved when I was in the second year of my residency at Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. When I got to read a few of the very famous emergency medicine blogs like MCRIT, RebelM, EMDocs.net, etc. Since then, I have been one of the admirers of the format and been closely following EM legends like yourself on social media. And that's how I got to connect with you on uh, last month on X. Moreover, uh, if I uh, tell the audience about myself uh, regarding my interest in format, what I have done myself regarding the format, so uh, I joined uh, uh, SLAM series, that's the Specialized Lectures in Emergency Medicine in uh, last year of my uh, uh, residency, and that was the chief residency. I was the chief resident in my residency program as well. So I joined the SLAM lecture series that was founded by my program director. His name is Dr. Shahan Waid, and uh, I have been hosting a different global experts in emergency medicine regarding different academic projects and those different global experts uh, these include Dr. Scott Wingard, Amal Mathu, Dr. Rezai, Salim Rezai and so many. Isn't it wonderful how we have this supportive community around the world who want to share what they're doing, share their experience and try to make the world a better place when it comes to emergency medicine and I really think that's one of the one of the really amazing things about FOMED is the people that embraced it, put their arms around it, and then also opened their arms to everyone else out there who wanted to join them in this tent that uh, we call FOMED or free open access to medical education. So it's, like I said, it's just a real thrill for me to be reaching halfway around the world to Pakistan and being able to talk to someone like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot agree more. All right, let's get on with a case for today's episode. A 66-year-old female with a history of smoking, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes presents to the emergency department with syncope while walking her dog. She complains of retroesternal chest pain radiating to her jaw. She is received in the resuscitation room. Monitors have been attached. She is tachycardic, hypotensive, and tachypneic. Intravenous excess has been achieved and IV analgesia has been given. The ECG shows sinus tachycardia with non-specific STT changes. The chest x-ray is unremarkable. However, she is still in severe pain. A postgraduate year 2 PGY2 resident asks you if it could be a ruptured aortic aneurysm, aortic dissection, or angina. Wow, we need to have some scary music there. Dun, dun, dun. Could it be this scary diagnosis? Yeah. <laughs> the diagnosis of acute aortic syndrome, or AAS, is commonly delayed or missed in the emergency department. Now, AAS has been referred to as, quote, the lethal triad that incorporates things like an aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, and penetrating aortic ulcer. It is a rare condition with a high mortality rate that can present in atypical ways. 
It affects approximately 4,000 people per year in the United Kingdom and about 10 times that amount in the United States. The annual incident rate of aortic dissection ranges between, uh, let's say, about 2.9 to 7.2 per 100,000 people. Yeah, moreover, the misdiagnosis rate is estimated to be between 60% and 38%, with a diagnostic delay of up to 24 hours for 25% of the cases, and mortality follows a linear increase of 0.5% per hour in first 48 hours. Yes, so the uh, longer uh, it takes to diagnose this serious life-threatening condition, the more life-threatening it becomes. In other words, the mortality rate goes up. Exactly. Now, there was a retrospective observational study from a Canadian superstar researcher, Dr. Robert Ohl, and it was published in the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine just this last year. This study found that between 2003 and 2018, so over a 15-year period, there were about 1,300 cases of AAS in Ontario. Now, it's reported an overall incidence annually of about 0.61 per 100,000 people, which is much lower than the previous reported rates. The study also highlighted the significant mortality rate associated with AAS, with a one-year mortality rate decreasing from about 50% down to 29%, and an ED mortality at about 15%. When we look specifically at uh, a traumatic chest pain presentations to the ED, the estimated incidence of AAS is 1 in 980. It can be like it can be like looking for a needle in a haystack of chest pain patients in the ED. The gold standard for diagnosing AAS is to perform a CT aorta angiogram. However, scanning every chest pain patient would have a very low diagnostic yield and expose many patients to the unnecessary ionizing radiation and end up being very costly, specifically for the patients from the low middle income countries. It would be great if there was a validated clinical decision tool to help clinicians to be more selective in using CTA to diagnose AAS. Some clinical decision tools have been devised and tested, though, for diagnosing AAS. The Aortic Dissection Detection Risk Score, or ADRS, is one of those CDTs that has been derived and tested. Four studies with methodologic limitations were included in a systematic review and meta-analysis of ADDRS and published in Academic Emergency Medicine in 2020. The authors concluded that patients with ADDRS score of less than or equal to 1 with a D-dimer less than 500 have high sensitivities for ruling out this scary condition AAS. However, it's unclear if it's a good enough for clinicians to use, better than clinical gestalt, and an impact analysis has not been done to determine, would this lead to fewer CTAs and D-dimers being performed? All right, that's enough background information. Let's get to the specific clinical question we're going to try to answer on today's podcast. The question is, what are the characteristics of ED attendances with possible AAS and how effective are existing clinical decision tools like ADDRS, Canadian Guideline, Sheffield, AORTAS, and the use of CTA in an undifferentiated cohort of ED patients. And what's the official reference for this? So uh, the reference is the study um, by the McClatchy et al. and DASH investigators it's diagnosis of acute aortic syndrome in the emergency department. It's called DASHED study. And it's an observational cohort study of people attending the emergency department with symptoms consistent with acute aortic syndrome. It's published in EMJ in November 2033. All right, let's run through the PCOT. What was the population included in this study? So this study included patients, adult patients of 16 years of age or older attending one of 27 EDs in England, Wales, or Scotland, 
with onset of symptoms within the past seven days of possible AAS. The symptoms are chest pain, back pain, abdominal pain, syncope, or symptoms related to malperfusion. And so the only patients that they excluded from this were if they had an absence of those potential AAS symptoms, which were chest pain, back pain, belly pain, syncope, or symptoms related to malperfusion. What was the intervention? So the intervention was uh, the clinical judgment, various clinical decision tools, characteristics and performance of existing clinical decision tools like ADDRS, AOTAS, Canadian and Sheffield, WAS, uh, CDTs. The D-dimer, that's, that was evaluated separately and in combination with other tools and CT angiogram. Yeah, and they didn't compare it to anything, but what was their primary outcome of interest? Uh, the primary outcome was diagnostic accuracy of clinical just halt, ADDRS, AOTAS, Canadian and Sheffield, AAS clinical decision tools, and D-dimer separately and in combination with this, these uh, clinical decision tools. And then they had four secondary outcomes. What were they? So the secondary outcomes, uh, the first one was the proportion of the patients in home uh, the ED clinical ED clinicians thought AAS was a possible differential diagnosis and most likely diagnosis who had confirmed AAS. The second secondary outcome was the pro- proportion of patients in home. The ED clinician thought AAS was not a possible differential diagnosis but had confirmed AAS. The third one is proportion of alternative diagnosis found on CT or CTA and final hospital diagnosis. And the last one is the median time from hospital presentation to imaging diagnosis. And so the T in PCOT is what type of study was this? Uh, So this was a multi-center observational cohort study that recruited patients both prospectively and retrospectively with symptoms suspected of having AS. And I like, uh, what I like about this study is this, uh, the way they have recruited the patient prospectively and retrospectively. All right. Well, the author's conclusions were, quote, only 0.3% of patients presenting with potential AAS symptoms had AAS, but 7% underwent a CTA. Clinical decision tools incorporating clinical gestalt appeared to be most promising but further prospective work is needed, including the evaluation of the role of the D-dimer. Let's go through some quality checklists for observational studies. Did this study address a clearly focused issue? Yeah, they have. Did the authors use the appropriate method to answer their question? Uh, Yeah, I believe they have uh, used an appropriate method. Was the cohort recruited in an acceptable way? I, I would say no, because they missed half of the patients. And was the exposure accurately measured to minimize bias? I believe yes. And how about the outcome? Was it accurately measured to minimize bias? I would say that there were certain biases, which we will be, you know, at the end of this podcast, we'll be uh, discussing those biases. So the answer is no. Oh, yes. We will be talking nerdy, my friend. All right. Was the follow-up of subjects complete enough? Uh, I would say no. All right. And how precise did you find the results? I'm unsure due to the many outcomes. Like uh, I mentioned, there there are more than three outcomes and the ranges are wide. All right. Do you believe the results? Uh, yeah, I, re- I believe the results, yeah. Now, this is an important one. Do you think the results can be applied to your local population? Because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a study that was done in Western population and it did not include multiple, cent- multiple centers from low middle income countries. Not a single center was from the low middle income countries. So I am unsure about this question. All right. Do the results of this study fit with other available evidence? Yeah, if I, if I see the literature, then I believe that this fit. And how about the funding of this study? Where did the money come from? So uh, this is a very important question. So this this study was supported by a Royal College of Emergency Medicine research grant. Dr. Reed is supported by an NHS Research Scotland Career Researcher Clinician Award. However, no conflict of interest by the authors were reported. All right, let's jump into the results. They identified 5,500 patients. Prospectively, there was 37%. 
retrospectively 48%, and they weren't quite sure in about 15%. The mean age was 55 years, with 47% being male. The most common complaint was pain, followed by abdominal pain, back pain, and syncope. The physician just told was available in 74% of the patients. AAS was considered a possibility by the physician in 24% of the patients. N number is 1082. A D-dimer was performed 13% of the time with 40% being elevated. A CT scan was performed in 10% of the cases with 78% being CTAs. A total of 14 patients were confirmed to have AAS, that is 0.3%, and the median time from the ED arrival to confirmation of AAS was 6 hours. And 33% of the patients who had a CT scan were diagnosed with an alternative aortic pathology. This included four ruptured thoracic aortic aneurysms, five ruptured triple A's, or those are abdominal aortic aneurysms, 21 non-ruptured thoracic or aortic aneurysms, and three previously known stable aortic dissections or intramural hematomas or penetrating ulcers. How about the key result? So this is the, uh, I believe this is the most important part of this study to understand that most patients, about 99.7% presenting to the ED with possible AAS acute aortic syndrome, do not have the condition and the clinical decision too did not improve on clinical just talk. That's very important. That's very important. Now, um, they had a primary outcome, and that was looking at the diagnostic accuracy of clinical gestalt and some of these clinical decision scores or tools, both with and without a D-dimer. What I'm going to do is I'll put a table in the show notes showing the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value in there. And I'll just remind listeners, of course, negative predictive value, if hardly anyone had the condition, negative predictive value is always going to look great. And they only had 0.3% of patients actually ruling in for this condition. So almost every possible thing, if you had gone in and said, no, I don't think it's that, are pretty close to 100% for negative predictive value because there were not that many cases. But let's highlight some of the secondary outcomes. Yeah, so the proportion of the patients in home, the ED clinician thought, AAS was a possible differential diagnosis was one person and mostly and most likely diagnosis that is 3.4 person who had confirmed. And then the proportion of patients in whom the ED clinician thought AAS was not a possible differential diagnosis, but then was confirmed to actually have AAS was 0.06 percent. Yeah, the proportion of Alternative diagnosis found on CT or CTA was 5% and top of and top 5 final alternative diagnosis those were 27% of the patients had P 26% had LRTI that's lower respiratory tract infection 21% aortic aneurysm not ruptured and 15% had ACS acute coronary syndromes and 8% had cholecystitis And then the final result we're going to give is that the median time from hospital presentation to imaging diagnosis was six hours. But let's get to the really fun part of the program. Let's talk nerdy. Are you ready to talk nerdy to me? Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to go through five points, and I'm going to start off with the first one. And we we mentioned this before, and this was the recruitment challenge. I mean, they went to extensive efforts to advertise, to engage with those 27 sites in the UK, and around half the patients couldn't be recruited prospectively. And this may have introduced some bias into the study. And conducting research in this area, it's hard. So this is, this is not a dig at those hardworking researchers. Research is hard. And some patients with AAS may have been missed because the diagnosis was not even considered. Yeah, uh, so the so missing cases of AAS. It's possible that there were missed cases of AAS as 90, per, 90 participants did not undergo CT angiogram. So there is a possibility that, that those 90 participants, among, them, uh, among those participants, there were a few patients who had 
AAS and the study focused on patients being primarily investigated for pulmonary embolism, which may have a higher prevalence of AAS. And that gets into one of the first biases I wanted to mention. And this is this is partial verification bias. We call that referral bias or workup bias. And this happens when only a certain set of patients who underwent the index test is verified by the reference standard. So if not every single patient who was considered to have AAS got a CT or a CTA, we really don't know. And in this case, only the patients who they thought it was going to be AAS with a positive D-dimer, then they're going to more likely get the CT or CTA to go on to have the potential to confirm the diagnosis. So this is partial verification bias or workup bias. And this type of bias would increase the sensitivity but decrease specificity. Yeah, and another, another bias, uh, which is um, in this, these kind of studies, it's very common, that's Hawthorne effect. That's also called observer effect. So when you conduct a research study with prospectively collected data, there is a possibility of introducing the Hawthorne effect. We have spoken about this before on the, you know, uh, Skeptic's Guide to, Guide to Emergency Medicine. This type of bias occurs when people know they are being observed and it changes their behavior. Clinicians knowing a study was being conducted on AAS may have altered their management of patients of patients presenting with symptoms suggesting AAS. Yes, I don't know about you, but certainly I know when I'm being watched or observed, my behavior can change. And so I'm sure that there's a potential Hawthorne effect if, if the researchers are going out there and saying, hey, we're going to be looking into AAS and we're going to be collecting data prospectively on this. And that may nudge people to behave differently when the study is actually taking place. Do you get affected by being watched when you work? Yeah, I'm no more a resident, so I would say this is this is not a bias that would affect me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the fifth and final point was differential verification bias. So this is called the double gold standard. This occurs when the test result influences the choice of the reference standard. So a positive index test gets the immediate gold standard, where patients with a negative index test gets clinical follow-up for this disease. So you can see that if they thought it was that, got a D-dimer, boom, they're going to go off and get the CTCTA because they're thinking about this. But let's say the uh, D-dimer is not greater than 500, and so they're not going to continue down this path, and they don't do the CTCTA. And so they have to just follow these people clinically and see what happens. And so this type of double gold standard bias, it can raise or lower sensitivity and specificity. And so if you want to take a deeper dive into these forms of diagnostic testing bias and the direction that they can, um, these biases can push diagnostic tests, you can go to that paper that I'm always talking about. <laughs> at all in academic emergency medicine in 2013. It's one of my favorite things to scream out. All right, so um, can you comment on the author's conclusions and compare them to the SGEM's conclusions? So uh, I believe that, Ken, you will agree with me that we generally agree with the author's conclusion. So in, in, in uh, whenever we talk about AAS, acute aortic syndromes, nothing makes sense. Yeah, it can be hard to make sense of it, and it can be a difficult diagnosis to make for sure. And that leads us right into the bottom line. What is the SGEM bottom line? So it's very important for the audience, so I will kind of, you know, uh, reinforce it, that it remains challenging to diagnose AAS based on clinical just thought alone, but clinical decision tools are not yet ready for prime time. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if we had some little tool that was super simple, or if it was a little bit more complicated, we'd get one of those little apps with MD Calc or something like that. But wouldn't it be great if, you know, we had perfect clinical gestalt, which none of us do, or we had a clinical decision tool that has been shown, it has been shown and demonstrated to be better than our clinical judgment. And we, we just don't have that in this rare diagnosis, which is life-threatening and can present in atypical ways it remains a challenge to figure out. So I know that you presented a case to start with and the resident, the PGY2, asked you a question which makes the alarm go, oh, geez, maybe I should be thinking about AAS. So how did you resolve this case? 
Okay, so the nurse administers uh, some fentanyl for pain control while you perform a point of cure ultrasound. This exam is the exam is equivocal while your clinical gestalt suggests an AAS. So you tell the resident to order a CTA and the scan reveals an aortic dissection of the thoracic aorta. You call cardiothoracic surgeon and the vascular surgeon, and the patient is rushed to operation room for the surgical repair. Uh, however, I would like to add that this is not, uh, you know, true in uh, real cases. So you take a lot of time to diagnose these patients because uh, you never think the aortic acute aortic syndrome as your first diagnosis when any patient is coming up with the back pain or chest pain. So in my part of the world, most of the time is acute coronary syndrome. So. Only, only a few of the physicians who have very bad experience with the acute aortic syndromes, only they will think about this as a first diagnosis in, in any patient who come up, comes up with any chest pain, abdominal pain, or the back pain. Yeah, that's the thing with common things. They tend to be common. And so we think of them yeah. more often because, yeah. well, they're common. And these rare conditions are, by definition, rare. And the other part of that is you said, you know, it wouldn't happen this fast. And this case, uh, this study says that, you know, the time is about six hours. So yeah, you're going to be down your diagnostic um, algorithm that you're using your clinical approach or your management to these patients. And you're going to be thinking things like ACS or acute coronary syndrome much sooner than you're thinking of an aortic uh, aneurysm syndrome. And so there is going to be a time. But then I think once you once you have identified it, I think that the surgical colleagues are quite rapid in going, oh yeah, we got to get on this quickly. And uh, they come quite quickly and um, and help us out in the emergency department with these serious conditions, these serious clinical cases. Yeah, uh, Ken, but uh, um, I just want to add here that, uh, you know, uh, as we discuss in our discussion here, that uh, the mortality uh, increases 0.5% every year for the first 24 hours. So, you know, uh, it takes six hours. The median time is six hours to diagnose acute aortic syndrome. So you can imagine about the mortality uh, of the, that patient who is in the ED. And it's very difficult because the patient becomes, uh, some, sometimes the patient becomes so critically ill that these patients are not even shiftable and even movable. And, and I've never uh, been to Pakistan, but I hope to come someday. But I can comment on my rural sites where I work. And this is going to take some time because sometimes we don't have a CT scanner. Yeah. If we do have a CT scanner, it's not available 24-7. And we certainly don't have a cardiothoracic or vascular surgeon in-house. And so we are going to have to transfer these patients to a higher level of care. And all of that takes time, and time can lead to uh, an associated increased mortality. What's the situation in Pakistan? Are, are there challenges with regards to, like, I, I work in a resource-poor resource environment often. I, I call it high-thought, low-tech. Um, do you have similar situations in Pakistan? So, uh, Ken, uh, the hospital where I have been working, uh, uh, the Aga Khan University Hospital, it's one of the, you know, resourceful, the most resourceful hospital in Pakistan. So, uh, if you will ask me if we have, I, I have the cardiothoracic surgeon 24-7, I have that. So, if I get this uh, patient with acute aortic syndrome and I, I, you know, I give a rush call to the cardiothoracic surgeon, the vascular surgeon, they will be uh, in the operating room within, you know, minutes. Uh, but, um, you know, the, we don't have this only hospital that will deal with the acute aortic syndrome. So if, if I see the other hospitals, which are government-based hospitals, uh, so I, I don't think that they have this, this facility to have this cardiothoracic surgeon everywhere in every in, in their every tertiary care center or if they have the vascular surgeon available at 24-7. So it's, uh, it's a bit difficult. Even if they diagnose the acute aortic syndrome in the ED, it's very difficult to get that cardiothoracic surgeon or the vascular surgeon on time and get that repaired. Isn't that interesting? So where you work on a regular basis, you have more access to care. And where I work in Canada, I have less access to care. You know, that's why that's why I'm always saying it all depends how you're going to take the clinical information, because the research is what it is. How are you going to take that clinical information and apply it to your local clinical practice? 
exactly i just i want to quote one of my teachers one of my great teachers uh, his name is dr nurbek so whenever we discuss about this low middle income countries and the high middle income high high uh, high resource countries so uh, every time when I, i i quote that pakistan is one of the low middle income countries uh, you know he he kind of uh, uh, correct me that you know wherever i am working that is aga khan university hospital this this doesn't come in low middle income setting low resource setting because i have all the resources which are uh, available in canada or us so <laughs> if I, you will take me then i have been working like in a, one of the most resourceful hospital so it's not a low resource setting <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on the setting it's not it doesn't depend on the country i would say it depends on the setting wherever we are receiving these patients Absolutely yeah so it's it's less country dependent and more specific to what do you have what resources do you have where you work and some um high income countries will have low resources like in rural or remote areas and some in low to middle income countries if you're in the large urban areas with an academic setting you might have very very robust services there Exactly All right so how are you going to clinically apply this study so um, while incorporating clinical gestalt and a d-dimer into a clinical decision tool show, shows promise further research is needed to evaluate whether it can reduce the risk of delayed or misdiagnosis of acute aortic syndrome compared to clinical gestalt alone and so how would you have a conversation at the patient's bedside because this this person is having chest pain and they may uh, you know it turned out that they're having an aortic syndrome so what would you say at the bedside so this is uh, one of the you know difficult part uh, where it's very difficult to you know uh, tell your patients what what uh, what is aas because they don't have this commonly so in my clinical judgment i would i i would tell them that uh, probably your symptoms may be due to the condition called acute aortic syndrome and i will you know translate it in in a very local kind of language and local uh, jargon and uh, i will say that AS is a rare but life threatening condition probably i would use a paper and a pen and i will make a diagram and let them know about it and uh, moreover i would uh, add that we are sending you for a ct scan to find out if you do have this condition we will be calling the surgeons uh, who can fix this problem that's great i like the fact that you you're not going to just speak in doctor terms you're going to speak to them in uh, something that they can be more likely to comprehend and getting out visual things visual aids and drawing something for them as well so i thought that was really good yeah all right it's time for the keener contest last week's winner was peter johansen an advanced care paramedic from vancouver bc he knew the active ingredient in edrf is nitric oxide What's the question this week? Okay, so uh this is one of the questions from my uh, area of interest. So the question is who was the pioneer of the first handheld direct laryngoscope with the light source and the battery power within the handle? So this could be a simple question like who was the pioneer of the first handheld direct laryngoscope? Yeah, so this this would be a battery operated one because it has a light on the end of the actual laryngoscope. Exactly. And so it has this light source, it's battery powered, it's not plugged into a wall, it doesn't have a cable, it's wireless, shall we say. Yeah. And so if you know the answer to this question, then send an email to the sgem@gmail.com with Keener in the subject line. The first correct answer will receive a cool skeptical prize. There are some other FOMED resources out on the Dash study and I'll put some links in the show note but I I really want to thank you again I can't believe how FOMED and has really shrunk the world and that we can connect and have this dialogue and and create some free open access to medical education so I'm really really happy that we were able to do this Thank you so much Dr. Kan once again for having me and um, um you know uh, it was my pleasure to be a part of uh, uh, Skeptics Guide to Emergency Medicine I have been uh, you know keen follower of your your teachings and uh, you you know your your articles and the way you you critically appraise the the literature uh, the medical literature that's available uh, on the internet 
so that's that's very helpful whenever we have questions in uh, on the floor so you, you know the books cannot answer all the questions which we see or which we face on the floors on the floor however these these format uh, blogs websites uh, they are so helpful that uh, you know they give us a direction uh, to follow so I, I, I again want to thank you a lot, not just for this podcast, but uh, for, you know, creating the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine and promoting the skepticism. Well, welcome to the nerd zone, my friend. You have one last responsibility, and that is to read the SGEM tagline. Uh, remember to be skeptical of anything you learn, even if you heard it on the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Talk to everyone next time.